All right, keep a bookmarker in 1 John chapter 1. We're going to come back to that. But turn, if you would, to Matthew chapter 19. Matthew 19, yeah. What we'll be preaching about this morning is actually having a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. It's a, it's a common moniker you hear today about, among uh, many churches, but I think a lot of people misuse it, and, and they use the phrase completely falsely and completely wrong. I'm going to explain that, what all that means, and why we should have a good relationship with Jesus Christ and how we can do so. But um, I want to start off just explaining that if you come here long enough, you, you might hear from people um, that we're the type of church that, that will often get accused of, of being legalistic. Now, who's heard that term before, legalistic? You know, you're being real legalistic. You're a legalistic church. I can't tell you how many times people refer to me and say, oh, well, I can't believe you're being so legalistic. And when they say legalistic, it means because you believe God's law. I mean, that's basically it. It's like... Oh, you believe what God's law says? Well, you're legalistic. I mean, it's silly. And, and the reason is because they don't want to adhere to it. They don't, want, they, don't, they don't care what God's law says. They say, oh man, we're just free in Christ. We don't need to worry about any rules or anything like that. You're just too legalistic. And oftentimes they'll, they'll refer to you as being a Pharisee, right? Oh, you're just some Pharisee. And when they hear about the standards, oh, oh, you don't think, you know, you think women should be modestly dressed? What are you, some Pharisee or something? And they throw around these terms. But I'll tell you what, they don't even understand who these people are that they're even referring to. They, they just hear one thing and they parrot it and they repeat what they've heard before. And it's evident usually when you talk to them, they don't know the Bible at all. You're in Matthew 19. We're going to get a little lesson, first of all, just on the Pharisees. Okay? Just real briefly about who they were and the way that they were legalistic is in the way that they wanted to get away with as much as possible. And they also put their own commandments above God's. So... If someone's going to call you a Pharisee or Pharisaical or anything like that, we don't, first of all, we ought to understand what the Bible teaches about the Pharisees because then if you ever use that term for someone else, use it appropriately. And if someone else is going to use that term on you, you know, understand what the Bible really teaches about this instead of just perpetuating a, a lie or a misunderstanding of even who the Pharisees were. So you're in Matthew chapter 19. Look at verse number 3. This is when the Pharisees were tempting Jesus Christ, right? Verse number 3, The Pharisees also came unto him, tempting him, and saying unto him, Is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? This is their question to Jesus Christ. He's saying, Is it lawful? Is it okay for a man to divorce his wife for every cause? They're tempting him. They're testing him. Verse 4, And he answered and said unto them, Have ye not read... And most of these people that call you legalistic or call you a Pharisee, you want to just say, have you not read? Haven't you just read your Bible? Because that's what Jesus' response was to the Pharisees. Look, haven't you read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female and said, for this cause shall a man leave father and mother and shall cleave to his wife and they twain shall be one flesh. Wherefore, they are no more twain, which means two, but one flesh. What therefore God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. And he's going all the way back to Genesis on that quote. He's saying, look, God made male and female. And when the two come together in marriage, they become one person. He said, God has brought them together. Now they're essentially one. There was two. Now they're one. He's saying, what God has brought together, don't divide that. Don't get divorced. Don't divorce your wife for every cause. That was his answer to him. He said, look, don't get divorced. God has brought you together. Don't divide it asunder. But then they answer. They don't like that answer. He says in verse 7, They say unto him, Why did Moses then command to give a writing of divorcement and to put her away? See, they're focused so much on this, this one aspect of the law where there was a, one particular situation where God would allow a divorce to take place. 
And then, you know what that situation is? It says, except for the cause of fornication. Now, one of the reasons why it's important to read your King James Bible and not one of these modern perversions is because every word has meaning. And that term, fornication, is the term that's used for that, for that physical relationship you have with another person when you're not married. Because when you're married and you have that physical relationship with another person, it's called something else. It's called adultery. In the days of the... In, in these days back then, marriages took place so, differently than they do today. In, in this sense, people would oftentimes be espoused to a husband or a wife, but not have the marriage consummated immediately. They would have their wedding and they would, they would say their vows, they'd have their, their ceremony, but then they wouldn't necessarily consummate that marriage right away. So you can have a husband. And this was exactly the case. Very, very famous couple, Mary and Joseph, right? They were espoused one to another, yet Mary was a virgin. Mary, the mother of Jesus Christ, was a virgin. That's why we, we believe in the virgin birth. Yet she had a husband. How is that possible? Well, because they got married, but they, weren't, they hadn't consummated the marriage yet. They hadn't completely fulfilled the marriage. And this is something that happens where the Bible says, look, you expect your spouse to be virgin, to have kept themselves pure. Because believe it or not, I know we're living in these weird, bizarre, wicked times. That used to be something that people held in high regard is your actual, you know, keeping of your own body and keeping yourself pure and keeping yourself pure unto marriage. And the reason why that, that allowment in the law was given for divorce was if you were to marry someone that you thought was virgin, before you actually consummate the marriage and, and complete the union in becoming one flesh, he says, if you find out, you know, maybe she's with child. She got pregnant. Well, how did that happen, right? We haven't come together yet. If you find out something like that, that was the allowable situation because that would show that the person commit fornication prior to your marriage. And that was a reason to then be able to put them away. And that's exactly what Joseph was thinking. The Bible says that Joseph, being a just man, was minded to put her away privily, which means, see, you know, privately, just, just to, to, to divorce her. And that would have been just according to God's law. That would have been acceptable and, and, and in line with what the Bible says is a grounds for divorce, a reason to get divorced. But that was the, the exception, basically, that God has allowed in his law. And now these Pharisees are tempting Jesus Christ, and they're saying, well, can a man just, just divorce his wife for every reason, just for any reason, what, whatever, under the sun? And Jesus answers this by saying, look, first of all, God never planned on you. When you get married, you stay married. He say, God join you together, let not man divide it asunder. And they say, well, well, what about this part of the law then where Moses said you could get a divorce? Verse 8 says, He saith unto them, Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, suffered you to put away your wives. But from the beginning it was not so. And I say unto you, whosoever shall put away his wife, except it be for fornication, and shall marry another, committeth adultery. And whoso marrieth her, which is put away, doth commit adultery. And then his disciples, and his disciples say unto him, if the case of the man be so with the wife, it's not good to marry. <laughs> well, wait a minute. If you can't just get divorced, then it's not even good to marry. And the reason why we're looking at this story is because the Pharisees were trying to find just every excuse under the sun to get a divorce. That's what they were looking for. They weren't looking for a justification. You know, they were looking for their own justification on their sin because they wanted to do as much as they possibly could get away with under the law. And Jesus is saying, you're looking at it the wrong way. You shouldn't be looking for every single possible reason you could possibly get divorced. He's saying, you should be looking at this like, hey, God joined us together, so we're not going to get divorced. That's the way that we ought to be looking at marriage. But the Pharisees were looking at it as saying, well, what's the most I can get away with? Now, there's two different types of attitudes you can have just in general when you're approaching God's Word. You can have an attitude of, 
I want to do my best for God, for Jesus, to live righteously, to live how the Bible says, and I'm just going to make sure that I go as far in one direction as I possibly could and as far as the right way as possible. Or you can say, well, I want to do what's right, but I'm just going to try to do the bare minimum. Right? For example, one of the standards that we believe in is that... Uh, the Bible says exposing of, of your thigh is nakedness, right? So people will, will um, say, oh, man, you're women, you know, wear the skirts and stuff. And, you know, because I don't, I don't believe that anybody, man or woman, should be wearing, like, you know, real short shorts or anything where you're exposing your nakedness. If the Bible calls it nakedness. It's a shame to show your nakedness. Cover yourself, right? But here is the difference in the way that you can approach this. You can say, well... Okay, so that's my thigh. So where's my thigh end? Okay, my thigh end's right here. So I'm just going to get right up to that line, and I'm going to say, boom, I've got that covered. And then that's it. Or you can just say, you know what? I love God. If he says that that's the limit, I'm going to go a little bit past it. You know, I'm, I'm going to just make sure that I'm not anywhere close to that borderline of where I might be doing something sinful here. And there's two different ways of looking at it. You can look at it where you just say, you know what, I want to do everything right as much as possible, or let's just see how close I can get to this. And the one where you're seeing how close you can get without technically you know, breaking God's laws or sinning, that's the Pharisaical type of an attitude. We're asking Jesus, can we just divorce our wife for every reason? Because look, I want to have as many reasons as possible to be able to divorce my wife instead of looking at it like, I don't ever want to divorce my wife because God has brought us together. And, and, and what God has brought together, I'm not going to divide asunder. Turn, if you would, to math, Matthew uh, 23. Just a few pages over. Matthew 23 and uh, verse number 23. Matthew 23, Jesus is railing on the Pharisees, the scribes, the lawyers, and he's calling them all a bunch of hypocrites. I love this chapter. It's a great chapter. It's a powerful chapter. But in verse number 23, he brings up a point here about the Pharisees. Matthew 23, 23 says, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin and have omitted the weightier matters of the law, judgment, mercy, and faith. These ought ye to have done and not to leave the other undone. So what he's saying here is that, you know, the really, really small thing, so he's saying you've paid tithe on your mint, your anise, your cumin. These are all these little spices, right? So you're not getting some huge harvest. Right? When people had to pay the tithe, whatever, they, whatever their increase was, you think of the increase of the field, they're growing grains or they're growing wheat, they're growing all these, whatever, the, whatever their crops were, they'd bring in one-tenth of their increase to God. That's their pay and their tithe. And he's saying to the Pharisees, look, you're even paying the tithe on these little things, like the, just the little spices that you're growing, the little stuff. But the problem was, see, they, they focused so much on the real small aspects, but they completely ignored the really important stuff. It says the weightier matters of the law, judgment, mercy, faith. These are all critical, key fundamentals of the faith. They had that stuff completely wrong and they were so focused on the little tiny things. But notice what he says here. He doesn't say that you shouldn't focus on the little things. It's basically saying put the priority in the right place. Hey, get the important things settled first and then you can work on the smaller things. But he says, these ought ye to have done, referring to the weightier matters, the law, the judgment, the mercy, the faith. And he says, and not to leave the other undone. So there's nothing wrong with what they were doing of paying the tithe on the little things. The wrong part was they, they, didn't, they just completely skipped over the most important stuff. And the reason why I bring that up is because, again, I'm someone who will teach and believe when it comes to the tithe. I believe we ought to pay the tithe. I believe the tithe belongs unto the Lord. I pay a tithe, and I pay a tithe on everything that's my increase. When people give me gifts, when the things come my way, whatever it is, even the smallest of things, I try to keep track of that stuff. But see, the way you avoid being a Pharisee is that I'm not just omitting the law and faith and judgment and all these other big things that the Pharisees had a gaping hole, a beam in their eye that they just did not have covered at all. So Jesus wasn't even saying not to, do, to, 
you know, to, to avoid doing the little things. Yeah, pay attention to little things too, but, but you ought to make sure that you got the big things taken care of. Now, turn if you would to James chapter 1. James chapter 1. So people throw around that term, being a Pharisee. They usually don't know what they're talking about or who the Pharisees really were. We got to, you know, take it in stride. We know what they mean, but um, the Pharisees really weren't, they weren't righteous people. They just wanted to look like they were righteous. They really just wanted to get away with as much sin as they possibly could. So when you actually love the Lord and you're trying to follow the letter of his law as much as possible, that's not being a Pharisee. Being a Pharisee is trying to make up as many excuses as possible to get away with things under the law. But look at James chapter 1, the last two verses there, verse 26 and 27, because I've heard so many people say this phrase too. It's real common these days. I don't have a religion. I have a relationship. How many people have heard that before? Now maybe, you know, people use this phrase. I've heard it before. Again, it's, it's, Ignorant is what it is. It's ignorant. It's catchy. People say, oh man, that sounds great. Yeah, yeah, no religion, just a relationship. Look at what the Bible says. Now, I don't like throwing words around as being negative or bad words. Because like, people will basically use the word religion as a bad word. As saying like, oh, yeah, I don't, I don't have, I stay away from religion. I have nothing to do with religion. Now, the Bible negatively talks about religion when it talks about the religion of the Pharisees. Yet yeah, they had a bad religion. When there's a false religion, when there's a false way, and that's really, yeah, stay away from that. But look at what James says here in verse 26, in verse chapter 1. If any man among you seem to be religious and bridleth not his tongue, but deceiveth his own heart, this man's religion is vain. So he's talking about someone who seems to be religious, but their religion is vain. It's meaningless. It's worthless. Yeah, that's the type of religion you stay away from, people who have a vain religion. But look at verse 27. Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world. He's saying, this is a good religion. This is what you ought to be doing. Hey, visiting the fatherless, visiting the widows. I don't want a religion. Well, if you're saying you don't want a pure religion, then that's what you don't want. You don't want to go out and visit these people. And also, you don't want to keep yourself unspotted from the world. No, I do want a religion. I don't want a vain religion. I don't want the religion of the Pharisees. But I want that pure religion that's talked about here in the book of James. Where it talks about going out and caring for the fathers and, was, and, and bringing the gospel to people and keeping yourself unspotted from the world. What does it mean to be, keep yourself unspotted from the world? You're keeping yourself in accordance with God's law. You're not letting the world influence you and drag you away from doing what's right. <clears throat> now let's go back again to 1 John chapter 1. Abigail, stop doing that and sit down in your chair. Say, why have a religion? Or not, they don't want to have religion, they don't want to have a relationship. Well, guess what? I have a relationship. I'm a son of God. I'm a child of God. So, yeah, we should have a relationship with Jesus. But see, the relationship that they're talking about, I think, is different than the relationship that I'm talking about. My relationship is I'm born again. God's my father and I'm his son. That's a relationship. And that's the relationship we need to have. But normally when people will make that type of statement, oh, I have a religion, I have a relationship, they're just talking about Jesus like being their buddy, being their pal. And I don't want to get too far ahead of myself because there's a verse that talks about that too where Jesus calls, us, calls his disciples his friends. But it's not you're like your buddy that, hey, we're going to go hang out at the bar together, watch a football game together. That's not how we treat our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. 1 John chapter 1. Because what I think they're referring to with a relationship with, with God is having fellowship with Him. Fellowship's the right word to use. It's not really a relationship, it's fellowship. I want to have fellowship with the Lord Jesus Christ, and I think all of you probably want to have fellowship with Him too. How do we achieve having fellowship 
with God. Let's see what the Bible says. If we want to have a good relationship, if we want to have good fellowship with Jesus Christ, what do we need to do? 1 John chapter 1, where we started reading this evening, verse number 5. This then is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. So he's saying, look, if you want to say that you have this great relationship with God, if you have this fellowship with God, and yet you're out walking in darkness, you're living a life of sin, he's saying you lie. You're a liar. You don't have fellowship with Christ when you're out living in sin, when you're out walking in darkness. It says you lie and not you don't know the truth, you do not the truth. You're not doing the right thing. You're not having good fellowship with Christ when you're living a life of sin. It's just not there. There is no fellowship. Our walk with God is extremely important in our Christian life. Now again, we know that salvation is by grace through faith. That's why I said, I already have a relationship with God where I'm a child and He's my Father. That's the first step. You need to get that established right away. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. But as many as received Him, them gave you power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on His name. That's where the relationship starts. The fellowship comes after that though. The relationship started with, with my children the moment they were born. They became my child. They're always going to be my child. But if they want to have good fellowship with me, if they want to be on my good side, if they want to receive blessings from me, then they better be walking in light, in the light of the laws that I lay down for them. Go to 1 John chapter 2. She's probably on the same page. See, our walk is not just some emotion of feeling close to God. And again, the same people that will repeat that phrase, oh, I don't have a religion, I have a relationship, will have a tendency to think that it's this big feeling inside of their heart of being close to God. Because what I have is so much better than you. Yeah, you just want to look at God's law and obey God's law and stuff, but I have this great relationship. And they say, I could feel this in my heart. Now, I'm not against having emotion. Okay, emotion's okay. You want to have emotion, that's fine. But just because you have some type of an emotion doesn't mean you actually are close to God. Just because you feel kind of warm and fuzzy in your heart doesn't mean that you actually are walking in light. Because in order to have the fellowship of God, you have to be walking in light. Otherwise, you lie and do not the truth. Many people claim to get a close feeling to God just by listening to music. And look, music can be spiritual. Spiritual songs and hymns. I love getting, you know, there is a feeling that I even get when I sing praises unto the Lord. But listening to music in and of itself does not put you any closer to God than you were before you started listening. It just gives you a feeling. It's just a nice feeling that you can receive. It doesn't mean it actually brings you closer in a relationship with God. Just by hearing music, by letting it come in your ears and receiving that, doesn't just make you, it just gives you a feeling. The perfect example is King Saul. Perfect example to this point. King Saul started off great, but then went down pretty quickly when he was disobeying God's commandments. He was being vexed by an evil spirit from the Lord. And he's trying to figure out what he can do. So some of his counselors said, well, hey, why don't you get someone to play you some music? And he did. He actually hired David to be a musician for him. And he would play the music. And when the music played, the evil spirit would depart from him. So he wouldn't be vexed anymore. He'd kind of lift up his spirits. He'd lift up his mood. He'd be feeling great. But then the spirit would come back again and haunt him and bother him and, and give him a hard time. Now, King Saul was not doing at that time what was right in God's sight. He wasn't, he wasn't walking in the light. He was doing things contrary to the will of God and was suffering as a result, but he just tried to put a band-aid on it by listening to this music and it just made him feel more spiritual. It made him feel like he was doing the right thing. 
It was just a feeling, but it was not the solution to his problem because his problem never ended up going away. It got to the point where even the music didn't help him, and he's throwing javelins at David and at his own son trying to kill him against the wall. The music is not the answer to that problem. Music will give you a feeling, but it doesn't mean that you're closer to God. 1 John chapter 2, look at verse number 1. The Bible reads, My little children... These things write I unto you that ye sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. And hereby we do know that we know him. This is how we know that we know God. This is how we know that we know Jesus Christ. If we keep his commandments. He that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoso keepeth his word, in him verily is the love of God perfected. Hereby know we that we are in him. He that saith, he abideth in him, ought himself also so to walk, even as he walked. So if people want to go out there and claim, oh yeah, I know God, God me, me and Jesus are buddies, we're like this, you know, I know Jesus real well. And you're not keeping the commandments? He's saying, you don't know, you don't know Jesus. You don't know God if you're not, not going to walk. You're a liar. It says, and the truth is not in him. That's what the Bible says. Don't get deceived by the people that want to chalk everything up to this great emotional experience of having this great relationship with God. I sat and talked to this lady for I don't remember how long. Brother Sebastian was with me. I was talking to this lady and, and she just kept on going on. She was like, yeah, but do you have a relationship with God? I kept saying, yes, I do. And she, was try she kept on trying to bring up all this emotional stuff. And I was like, look, the Bible says very clearly that we're to do these things and not do these. You know, it, it says it in black and white. And she just kept, she couldn't listen to what the word said. It was just, I don't think you really have a relationship. You know, I just have this relationship where I just feel so close to him. You don't even know him if you're not keeping his commandments. Now look, that doesn't mean you're not known of him. When you get saved, God knows you. When you put your faith on Jesus Christ, God knows you. You are known of God. But it doesn't mean that you really know that much about Him. You know enough to get saved. You know enough to put your faith on Jesus Christ for Him to, to pay for all of your sins and be saved and to become that infant, to become that newborn baby in Christ. But it doesn't mean that you really know the Father. If you claim you really, oh man, I really know about God. I know a lot about Jesus. And you're not keeping His commandments? You don't know anything about Him because... What do you think he wants you to do? What do you think he gave us the commandments for in the first place? To follow him. It wasn't just for, for, for kicks. It's not just like, oh, let's just see. I'm going to give these guys some suggestions. Yeah, if you want to live a, a pretty decent life, here's a guideline for you. Here's some suggestions. No, they're commandments. He says, you need to do this. Thus saith the Lord. And even at the beginning there, 1 John chapter 2, he says, look, I'm writing these things unto you so that you don't sin. I know that we're free from the curse of the law. I get it. But it doesn't mean that we just go off and continue in sin. You know, Romans chapter 6 says, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. Now we know that grace will abound. Hey, if you're saved and you sin, God's grace will cover that. No matter how much you sin, God's grace will cover that. But does that mean you just keep on sinning? No, of course not. Of course you don't. And if you do, you don't really know God. If you claim to know Him, you say, the Bible says here in, in 1 John chapter 2, you're a liar. You don't really know Him. You're not keeping His commandments. Jump down to verse number 15 there in 1 John chapter 2. Verse number 15. Even more people than would say that they uh, have a, a good relationship with God would probably say that they love God. I mean, almost everybody I talk to would probably say, well, yeah, I love, do you love God? Yeah, I love God. Of course I love God. Who doesn't love God? 
Well, we'll find out who doesn't love God. Look at verse number 15, 1 John chapter 2. The Bible says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And you love the things of this world. You love what this world's putting out. You love this world's entertainment. You love everything that this world has to offer you. The love of the Father is not in you. You don't love God. If that's what you love is the things of this world. Why? Because Satan is the God of this world. Satan is, is, is the one who's putting out the, th the music in this world. Satan's the one putting out the movies and the entertainment in this world. Satan's the one putting out all the garbage out there. And they say, if you love that stuff, you don't love God. Look at chapter 5, 1 John chapter 5. 1 John chapter 5, verse number 1. Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and everyone that loveth him that begat loveth him also that is begotten of him. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. Get this, verse number 3. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not grievous. So you claim that you love God? This is the love of God that we keep his commandments. You can't say that you love God if you're not keeping his commandments, if you disregard what the Bible says, what the law says on how we ought to be living. If you completely disregard that and you say you love God, you're a liar. Because the love of God is to keep his commandments. His, his commandments are not grievous. It's not, it shouldn't cause you sorrowful, it's be sorrow to keep God's commandments. You know, a lot of people will tell you, oh man, I can't believe you. You know, like, they'll, they'll look at Christians and say, you don't, you, you don't have any fun, do you? Right? I mean, the Bible's strict. I mean, you can't, you can't be going out and getting drunk. You can't fornicate. You can't do drugs. You can't do all this. You, how do you even have any fun? This is not fun. These commandments aren't grievous. What's grievous, what causes sorrow, is all this, the, the sin of the world and getting caught up into that bondage and getting drunk and going out and fornicating and doing all those things. That's going to pierce you with many sorrows. Just like the love of money will. God's commandments are for our benefit. And the, the quicker we can get that through our heads, the better off we'll be. Just like my own children. You know, I don't just make up rules for them because I don't want them to have fun. For example, we just filled up our little, our, our little inflatable pool with water. I just got the thing filled up for the kids. And there's a rule. And the rule is that if there's not mom or dad present, they are not allowed to go out there and get into that pool. Now, the adults here can see the obvious. There's a very good reason to have that rule. It's because we love our children. We don't want anything bad to happen to them. Without an adult present, they could easily drown. Right? But from a kid's perspective, it might just be like, oh, what, you don't want us to have any fun? Oh, we can't just go out there and go swimming whenever we want? I mean, come on now. Why do we have these rules, Dad? I mean, we just want to have some fun. Why do you have to be mean about it? People look at God's law the same way. Oh, I, I just want to have a few drinks. Oh, come on, God. What's the big deal? What's the big deal? Why can't I just have a little fun? God's commandments are for our protection. They're for our benefit. They're not grievous. It's not something that God's trying to, to just, yeah, I, I want you to go through this life and never enjoy anything and not have any fun because I just hate you and I just feel like doing this to you. It's not God. That's not the God of the Bible. Jesus Christ himself said in John 14, 15, if you love me, keep my commandments. A lot of people claim to love God and claim to love Jesus. But do you really? Turn, if you would, to John chapter 15. Because if you do, you'll keep the commandments. Now look, none of us is perfect, which is why none of us have a perfect love for God. If we did, we wouldn't be sinning anymore. 
But we, but we do. We don't have the perfect love of God. I mean, think about, think about this. Every time that you sin, every time, every time you think a lustful thought about a woman, every time that you have a foolish thought, the Bible says the thought of foolishness is sin, every time that you do anything against God, that's just one more sin that you added on the back of Jesus Christ that paid for all of your sins when He died on the cross. And He paid for them in three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Now, He did that already, and I get God can see the future. God knows everything. He's outside of time, and He was able to pay for this stuff. But you just let that sink in that every fault of yours was on, laid on the back of Jesus Christ. How much do you really love Him when you just keep piling on to that? Here you go, Jesus. I'm just going to keep on doing all this wickedness and all this sin and throw it on you. What people need to understand is the type of relationship that we need to have with Jesus because a relationship is very important. Unfortunately, most people that use that catchphrase, you know, I have a, a relationship, not a religion, will treat Jesus more like a worldly buddy than every, anything else. And I was getting to this before. I didn't want to get too far ahead of myself. Now, having Jesus as a buddy is a good relationship to have. Have Jesus as a friend is a good relationship. But let's look at how Jesus defines being his friend. Because like I said, it's not just going and hanging out at a football game or whatever. That's what you might like to think about Jesus as. But let's see how Jesus defines being his friend. Look at John 15, verse number 8. The Bible reads, Herein is my Father glorified, that ye bear much fruit, so shall ye be my disciples. And the Father hath loved, as the Father hath loved me, so have I loved you. Continue ye in my love. If ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love. Again, we're, you're, you're going to live, you abide in the love of Jesus when you keep his commandments. Even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things have I spoken unto you that my joy might remain in you and that your joy might be full. Keeping the commandments, abiding in God's love is going to bring you joy. It's, they're not grievous laws or commandments. It's for your benefit. It's going to make you happy. It's for your joy. Verse 12, This is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Which is what Jesus did for us, right? And he says, Ye are my friends, in verse 14. With one caveat. If ye do whatsoever I command you. Oh yeah, Jesus is my buddy. You know, we're friends. Oh, you know, And people kind of throw that around almost blasphemously. You know, I talk to people, Oh yeah, G you know, Jesus right here with me. He's always, you know, like, Look, he says you're his friend. If you do whatever he tells you to do, he's like, then you're my friend. Then we've got that close of a relationship we're friends when you're doing everything that I commanded. Henceforth I call you not servants, for the servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth, but I have called you friends. For all things that I have heard of my Father I have made known unto you. And where we started reading there, it said uh, in verse 8, you know, Herein is my Father glorified that ye bear much fruit, so shall ye be my disciples. If we want to be a disciple of Jesus Christ, if you want to actually be someone who's a follower of Christ, someone who has a close relationship with Christ, then you need to be bearing much fruit. How you bear much fruit? By keeping His commandments, by going out and preaching the gospel and winning other souls unto Christ, reproducing yourself, another Christian in someone else, you're bearing fruit. You're bringing forth after your own kind. You're a saved, born-again believer. When you bring forth another born-again believer, you're bringing forth after your own kind. You're reproducing. You're bearing fruit. And that's how you become a disciple of Jesus Christ. Now, the, disciple, the type of relationship that you have with Christ is up to you. Obviously. We all have free will. Decide what you want to do. I'm going to try to help that relationship for everybody in this church by preaching the commandments from God's Word and not of man. And it will bring you joy. See, a lot of people bristle at the, at the, the hard preaching on sin, on the preaching on the commandments. Oh, I can't believe... Why are you going to the Old Testament again, Pastor Bird? Why, why do you got to preach from that? 
Because God gave us commandments. And he wants your joy to be full. I'll re turn, if you would, to Matthew 5. It's the last place you're going to turn. Matthew chapter 5. 1 John chapter 1, verse 3 said, that, we, that which we have seen and heard declare we unto you, that ye also may have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and with the Son, Jesus Christ. And these things write we unto you, that your joy may be full. I want your joy to be full. I want my joy to be full. And the way that's going to happen is by getting that good relationship with God, the good relationship with Jesus Christ, getting close and having fellowship with Jesus Christ by keeping His commandments, by doing what's right, by walking in the ways that He has set, up, set forth for us and in the light. We'll close with this one last thought from Jesus. Matthew chapter 5, start reading in verse number 14. But reads, Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. Jesus Christ himself saying, look, don't think that I came to destroy the law and the prophets. I didn't come to destroy that. I didn't come to just abolish the Old Testament, to abolish God's laws. That's not why he came. He came to fulfill. He fulfilled all the prophecies that were, that were spoken of him beforehand. Verse 18, For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. He's saying that the law is going to remain until everything's fulfilled. Verse 19, Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments and shall teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. You ask yourself this question, do you want to be least or greatest in the kingdom of heaven? You want to be least, eh, don't worry about the little thing. Don't worry about the little commandments. Don't, don't worry about that stuff. And you know what? Go ahead and just start teaching other people. You don't need to worry about that. God doesn't care. God's love. Don't, don't worry about all those little details in the Bible, all those laws, all those Old Testament laws. I don't know why you've got to follow that. No, actually, I want to be greatest. I want you to be greatest. I want you to know the joy of God. I want you to be able to follow those commandments and that when you get to heaven, you can say, yeah, thanks, God, for rewarding me because I actually cared about every one of your words because I actually believed you and you said that that all Scripture is given by inspiration is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. I believe that. So I study all the Bible and that when I, when I make decisions in my life and how I'm going to live, I'm not going to just look at, you know, only the red letters or only the New Testament. I'm going to look at the whole Bible. I'm going to look at every commandment in this book and I'm going to apply it appropriately in my life. Let's bow our eyes and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, Thank you so much for this great book of instruction. God, I pray that you would please help us to get a, a better fellowship with you, a better relationship with you by understanding that we need to be um, serious about listening to your words, listening to your instruction, dear Lord, and not being flippant about any of them, but that we would treat you with the honor and respect that you deserve, dear God, and that you would... Um, Help us to continue to make the changes in our life. We know that none of us are perfect, dear God, but that's not an excuse. That's not something that we just say, oh, well, we're not perfect and just give up. Help us never to give up on trying to, to change our lives and to become a, a better child of God, dear Lord. We want to be conformed to the image of your Son, and we know that it will happen one day, but please help us to get, to get as close as possible in this lifetime now, dear Lord. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.